Hey, this is John Malcolm with the rock band, the Simple Radicals. So we have this really cool show called Music and a Brew, where we talk about two of our favorite things in life, music and brew. Each show, we talk to some of the best musicians and music industry folks and discover some of the best craft beers and breweries across America. We'll also learn about their craft, what makes their beer so special. Let's face it, there's absolutely nothing better than chatting music over a nice cold brew. And sometimes you learn some things that may never have been revealed before, like from Kenny Erna. On today's episode of Music and a Brew, John and John chat with Kenny Arnoff, world-class drummer with John Cougar Mellencamp, Bon Jovi, and Smashing Pumpkins, as well as author of the new book, Sex, Drums, Rock and Roll, The Hardest Hitting Man in Show Business. Kenny shares incredible stories from his career over a couple of ice cold beers, courtesy of Bloomington Brewing Company. Later in the show, we'll be talking with Bloomington brewmaster, Jeff Meese, hearing about his quest to create the perfect beer. Kenny, that poster you have on your wall, I have that on my wall. Of Which one? Are, what? Where the hell did you get that? That was my show. I booked you guys. I was a concert director for Union Board. That was my concert. With dude, Dan- dude, this is sick. First of all, you don't look like you're old enough to be doing it. What were you doing uh, with Dan? That was 1980. 83. Dan Ross and the Burnettes opened it for you guys. Oh, it was 83? Uh, what? Dude, that is free. You know, I've got like 1,300 gold platinum records, and I got millions of pictures, and I decided to put that one there, and you. <laughs> That's so, weird. That's right there. Show everybody. That's it. That's so funny. Sold out. Oh, I don't have the one that's so sold out. You got that? Yeah, that's a, that's a collector's item. That's so funny. Where did you. Dude, that is bizarre. That yeah. That's. That's bizarre. Yeah, I booked that show. That's crazy. Because that was John M- Mellencamp um, trying to decide if he could go out as – he didn't want to open up for anybody anymore. He wanted to see what it was like to be the headliner, even though uh, we weren't I, – I, let me explain. In, in 1982, we came out with a record called American Fool. Yep. We highlighted uh, Hurt So Good as a – and 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 Jack and Diane both in the top ten at the same time. Yeah. Back then, if you were, had uh, two singles in the top ten at the same time, that means you were bad mofos because right. back then, back then the two basic formats in radio were either album oriented rock where they would play all the songs on the album, or you had top forty or top one hundred which you'd play the singles right. and uh, and um, at the single uh, the singles that radio format would watch and see what people liked on the album in the album oriented uh, radio format. And they'd, they'd start to see the statistics. People were calling, Oh, I like that one. I like that one. And the one that got the most uh, response, then the, the top uh, 100 radio station would start playing that. And, and, and you see the record company uh, and the radio had to get, congruent on yeah. that so that they'd be on the same team and uh anyway so that record was huge we were opening up for heart and heart was big but they came out with an album and it kind of w- didn't do great right. and we were the new the new band that was right. getting all over mtv and we just exploded yeah. uh, that year i think we did a 120 shows in nine months with heart oh, oh my god man. flying around in two little planes six seaters Almost crashed a couple of times. Oh, nice. Oh, yeah, nice. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. when you became real rock stars. <laughs> oh, yeah, dude. We were, dude, we were, uh, there was one uh, story, I haven't told this story for a long time, where we're going from uh, Florida into Mississippi, kind of where the Skinner thing happened. And right. we were getting hammered. It was a right. day off, and we were getting <laughs> hammered and just, partying and all of a sudden i heard the bass player was up front we had like a pilot who's 26 years old oh god and all of a sudden we heard the autopilot uh thing go ding that means now he's flying manual oh means, shit yeah which means 26. is he gonna do this is he gonna right. do this? <laughs> so all of a sudden he went uh, oh no so oh no 
I saw all the drinks come out of the cans, <laughs> start floating by the three three hundred pound bodyguard didn't have a seat a belt on. He started uh, 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 levitating, going through the cabin. Well, here's the thing. So it goes down, and I'm looking at the city lights, right? right. And then he brings it back up, right? right? And everybody comes crashing down, and our faces are like. <laughs> And uh, as we're going down, we're going like, ah! he brings it back up. And this is what you don't want to hear. Oh, no. All the lights on the dashboard light up, all these red lights coming on. Oh, and God. the pilot goes, oh, f <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to hear that. Two and, words you don't want to, you don't want to hear yeah. that from your pilot or your doctor. Exactly. Uh. Exactly. So what happened was the plane stalled. Now, in my mind, I thought I, I thought I, I thought it was. I'd heard if the plane stalls in the sky, you're pretty much f you can't, right, you can't right, start it. Right. But I, apparently, you can. Obviously, we did. But I didn't know that. So we start. I mean, the, these planes have a great glide ratio. Right. But it's going down. Oh no! It's going down, and I'm looking at the city, and this is kind of where Skinner had his crash. That area of the oh. world. We're going. Are you? Kid me? Oh no! And I'm like going, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god! And he's going, god. the pilot's going, do 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 do, bam bam bam! <laughs> Everybody's like freaking, and all of a sudden, it started. Oh my god! It's an all that's an almost famous moment from that, yeah. that scene in the movie. That's crazy, man. You accept me? Nobody, nobody confessed at that moment. We were right. smart. <laughs> <laughs> I was just kidding. Uh, yeah. I was joking. So, I didn't mean to say you're. A I was just kidding. I was my my beer was floating. Yeah. So they I, we landed. I mean, I I laid on the tarmac, right? and kissed the ground. Oh, that that was a you had a near death experience. Yeah, that's crazy. So the point is, <laughs> I yeah. skipped that story. That the point is, that. John decided he didn't want to open up. You know, he didn't like. John didn't want to record in LA anymore. He wanted to record in Indiana. Right. He didn't want to work for anybody. John was always, you know, when we opened up for the Kinks, the first tour I ever was on with John. Yeah. We opened up for the Kinks and they said, you cannot, now the two Kinks, uh, Dave, Ray Davies and Dave Davies. Right. They had Eagle ramps. You remember they used to have Eagle ramps that go out to the audience. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. So Ray would go down one. Dave would go down the other. They didn't like each other. They didn't talk to each other. Right. If if one was in the hallway, the security guard would have to look to see if the other guy's there. They'd never, <laughs> but they they'd come on stage. So they told John, "You cannot go down those eagle ramps. You're the opening act." And they only gave us half lights, half you know, like they kept the PA softer. Right. And they said, "You can't smoke on stage." Well. John would come out every night, smoke, <laughs> and then you go down one ego ramp and be cocky. I love it. Throw the cigarette out, go running around the it. other. Finally, they said, hey. They said, no more sound check. You can't have a sound check. So John said, okay. So he had me go on stage first. Right. And we do, you, you remember that song, 30 Days in a Hole? Oh, yeah. yeah. So I go, boom, boom, ba, boom, 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 ba, boom, boom. And I was doing the sound check. And when I hit every drum, and the engineer would go with a flashlight. Okay, I got you. Bass player would come out. Boom, 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 boom. Flashlight. One guitar player. Ba, 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 ba. Flashlight. Miss guitar. Ba, 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 ba. Girls would come out. Thirty days in a hole. Boom, 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 ba, boom, boom. Thirty days. Then John would come out. Smoking. <laughs> cigarette goes down the catwalk. Goes down the other one. Finally, he just went. <clears throat> pulled the plug on us. No. Yeah. Wait, we, we were playing live? Yeah. He pulled the plug while you guys were performing in front of the audience? Yeah, somebody on the crew. They were, This was English crew now. The English crews are tough. Wow, and I'll say. They, didn't, they waited for a while, but they got pissed off that John was being so arrogant. So John, I mean, John just, he just like had a f attitude, which is, can yeah. I swear? Can I swear on this? On this? Yeah. Too late. Yeah. Too, Too late. late. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Well, <laughs> so, um, the George anyway, Carlin section there. Yeah. So anyway, John just, it just, it, I'll never forget. We, we opened up for the who. Oh man. 
Three shows, yeah, in wow. three stadiums. And John's going, I'm not going to open up for The Who. They don't want to see John Mellencamp. Right. They want to see The Who. Right. And he was right. But the our, our manager said, but you're going to be playing in front of 80,000 right. people. First show. And, you know, it's us. I think it was Stevie Nicks and then The Who. Yeah. So we're using backline gear. We're Boulder, Colorado. John's pissed off. We get out there. And John's doing, we're doing the thing. And when John, if, if it was going bad, John would just say, I need a lover, which is the last, which <laughs> yeah. is the last song. Yeah. We just go from song two to the last song and walk up. They started throwing <laughs> at us, you know, before we went to, I need a lover and we're ducking and all the <laughs> tomatoes. soap is going into Stevie Nicks's gear. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. So well, that's when they allowed you to bring tomatoes and soap into a stadium, of course. Yeah, now you yeah, can't. Which no, yeah. So <laughs> anyway, John's going, F- this. He gets out. And John's in the dressing room with the promoter, yeah. Barry Fay. I'll never forget. Oh, yeah. I, and, I, and I hear furniture flying, hitting the walls. <laughs> John is going nuts. I told you, you mother. Because he's playing. He booked all the three shows. Right. So the next show is in San Diego, I believe. John gets up on um, it's it's us Lover Boy and uh, and then uh, the Who. John gets up on back then when they didn't uh, fly the PA. It was built it was built on the on the stage or on right. the ground up. Right, right. John jumps up on one of the cabinets <laughs> and he's dancing like this. And I'm going no. I see a wine bottle. No. Wine. Yeah. Now let me explain. They're throwing so much shit at us. <laughs> John turns around, he's dancing, he gets hit in the head. Oh, jeez. He goes down. Oh, no. Now, I don't know if he's blacks out or he fakes it, but he goes down. Regardless, it looked great. <laughs> so we, we stop playing. We go off the stage. The next song in the set list is Hurt So Good. Oh, perfect timing. But, uh, so John gets a, gets a hard hat on. He, <laughs> he, he walks back on. He goes, listen, you mother you threw that bottle and hit me. Get your ass up on the stage and face me face to face. Did he come off? <laughs> no. Oh. But they wouldn't have let him. But the point is, when we got done and the who hit the stage. Yeah. They that was a, that was just a tradition. Definitely. They threw so much at the who. They were complimenting you. <laughs> yeah. Roger Dalton's doing this and he's ducking oh and Twistle's like hitting oh. bottle rockets off. See, we didn't see the. That was the second show. The first show, as soon as we were done, we got in our little planes and took off. We never saw the who. The second show, that's when we realized, oh, it's a tradition. Oh, my God. I was going to say, what was more humiliating, getting stuff thrown at you or opening up for Loverboy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, uh, you know, so anyway, John's like, F- this. I want to do my own show. Yeah. That's why John's decided, can I afford to do small venues? Get yeah. like, uh, the, uh, what's his name? The, the haircut guy uh, and the brunettes. Uh, what was his name again? Dan Ross. Dan Ross, right. Yeah. Dan Ross used to cut my hair when I had hair. Anyway. Oh my God. Uh, yeah. And so that's how, that's how you, is that Dan Ross on your poster too? He, he toured with you guys? Yeah, we did a, a Midwest tour, yeah. Yeah, he's on my poster too. That's so funny. So the band, yeah, it's uh, Dan Ross and the brunettes, yeah. yeah. Oh, but that's, that one says Radio City Music Hall. Oh, okay, this New was York. our auditorium, April 10th. Yeah. yeah. So the point is, is that John was, John was definitely forward thinking. He says, can I make this work? So I'm the, the top bill. I don't care if I'm right. playing in front of 80,000. I want it to be my show. Yeah. Can I afford to do it? And he figured a way. You get Dan Ross, he probably paid him, you know, <laughs> you know in sandwiches or something. You know? right. and, <laughs> and, and, and Dan Ross was happy to be on tour because – this was great. All no, of John's true. audience got to see. Yeah. And Dan was really good. He was a cool, he was, was a good he artist. Was he Indiana band? He was originally from Portland, Oregon, I believe. Oregon, okay. okay. Yeah, so, but he had a band. He was living in Bloomington. He had a band. And he, he knew what was cool. He was oh, cool. Fantastic. And so, um, yeah, so we, um, uh, we did that. And then John never, I don't, we never opened up again because no. the, that was the Aha uh-huh record. The next record was Scarecrow. Oh, and that, I, well, shoot, we we're now doing uh, arenas, yeah. three-hour show, no yeah. opening act. We take yeah. an intermission, 
And I met, and then we did Jubilee, which was just as big arenas. And I remember Elton John, I, I was, became a big session guy. And, um, I remember, uh, uh, Bernie Toppin. I recorded with Elton John for two days and Bernie Toppin got me the gig to play with Elton to wow. do tour. And wow. I didn't, and I turned it down to stay wow. with John. I did. Good I call. Know. <laughs> I don't know. At the time, I don't know. At the time, it, it, yeah, yeah, because I mean, so I we're playing at the LA Forum, sold out, and Bernie Toppin comes down, and goes, I can't believe you turned down Elton John. I got you the gig with Elton John. Oh man! And I said, Hey Bernie, why are you here? <laughs> uh, so I want to see John Mellencamp. Come here. Oh, Look he didn't know you're the drummer. No, he did. Oh. But I wanted to say, there's twenty thousand people here. Yeah. 360. Yeah. Every time, every song I play, most about 98% I recorded. And when I do that big drum fill in Jack and Diane, yeah. that 20,000 people get up and they're going, yeah. That's and it. they're air drumming That's to me. Yeah. I said, I'm, I'm not, yeah. I'm not, I'm just not, I'm, I'm part of this band. Yeah. These are my songs. Yeah. I said, yeah. that's a tough thing to let go. Right. And he went, I got it. Yeah. But yeah, yeah. Sometimes I think in my sleep, God, what an idiot. You turned down Elton John. No, no, even no. even John Mellencamp, when I told him, I was in the back of a limo but sitting, or a town car. And I was sitting behind him in like some sort of car, van or something. And I told him that, and I saw his face in the mirror go like, holy shit. He turned down that like you stupid idiot. Why'd you do that? <laughs> if that doesn't show loyalty, see that's when you decided you're playing with somebody and not playing for somebody. Yeah, yeah. You were playing with Mel and Cam and not playing for Elton John. That's a I mean, it was John's band all along. He got yeah. you know most of the money, but it, it was it was it, it was a band vibe in that you know we all we played basketball together. We, yeah. we, 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 we played sports together. We, we were, we were a game. We're a and then you're a family. Yeah. As time went on, John became more John and we yeah. were the band. And, right. and eventually, I mean, at the end of Lonesome Jubilee, the last concert, you know, I'm sitting there. I mean, I, not literally, but I could have been two chicks in one arm, a bottle of champagne, you know? Yeah. It's the end. Great. And John comes up with a bonus check and throws it at me and goes, Hey, don't spend it in one place. I'm quitting the music business for three years. And I went, <laughs> so I, I, Yeah. He, he did. Oh, hold on. Let's see. My, my engineer. Hey, Dave, are you here? I'm not. I, I don't think I'm going to be able to make it. Okay, let me call you back. I'm doing a podcast. You're on it right now. This is my engineer, everybody. All right, see What's you, Dave. Up, man. All right, bye. <laughs> So what happened was, um, I, you know, the way he said it was very believable. Yeah. And, and this was a life changing moment, life changing moment. So what year is this? 1988. 88. Okay. With the, uh, with the Milwaukee Fest or Summerfest. But the, 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 the reason why it was a life changing moment was number one, I realized, oh my God, I am literally at the mercy of what John Mellencamp does because for the viewers, the way we operated, I got in the band in 1980. We, the most we ever took off was a month. We, we would go, every record was a two year cycle, right? You, you, John would write the songs. We'd arrange them. We'd rehearse them. Eventually go in the studio, record them. It could take nine months back then there was money. So if we wrote a record that sucked, we'd start again. Right. Until you had, because you're competing with Springsteen, the police, yeah. Elton John, yeah. uh, Bob Dylan, yeah. uh, um, uh, uh, Billy Joel, uh, whoever's on the radio, yeah. uh, Tom Petty, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. Back then, you had to have great drum sounds, great drum beat, great yeah. uh, bass sounds, great drum uh, bass parts, great guitar hook lines, great sound. You had to have bridges. You had to have, um, you had to have intros, verses, uh, pre-choruses, choruses. Yeah. You had, man. It was none of this like you get in the bedroom and just kind of work on a computer. Yeah. It was it was a band it was a working, it, and it, you had to come up with so many yeah. amazing parts that could blow out your heroes. How are you going to do something better than the Stones? You got to come. There's only right. so many. There's only so many places on the radio. Right, right, right. So you're right. you're competing with all these iconic people. Right. How are you going to get on the radio? Right. So you have to come up with better songs than them. It's yeah. not like you just program a drum beat and just no. that's cool. 
and rap no. over it? No, whoa, not at all. You had, you had to mi- write you you had to write hits. 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 You had to write hits. And that meant I, lyrics. I remember, reading, I remember reading something you said um that when you when you think about your drumming, um the first point you said was about uh, creating it so that it's a hit on the radio. You know, yeah, here, here, what you're saying is this. Some, uh, when I ask, all right, the purpose of a drummer. Right, that was it, yes. Or the purpose of any session person. But let's say, we'll talk about me. The per- my purpose as a drummer, when I'm making records, right. was one thing and one thing only. Right. Get the goddamn song on the radio to yeah. be number one. That's so it. that means... I'm in the service business. It's right. not about me. Right. It's about we. Right. How can I get that guy's song on the radio to be number one? Right. So whatever I come up with, whatever I'm thinking, whatever I say, or whatever I don't say, should be appropriate to help this artist or band get their song on the radio. It's not about, well, that, I, I want to do this. No, yeah. I, yeah. I have to be like a producer. You're not going through the motions. You're, you're, yeah, you're producing it. As I a, am producing. Yeah. You can and hear I, that and you're playing. Thank you. Know, you. You can hear it and you can hear it. You, you play the song. You're not playing the drums. You yeah, know? exactly. Exactly. So, so I'm looking at what is the purpose here? And so once I figure that out, oh, my God, I mean, everything went to the next level. The next day after John said, I'm not playing, I'm, not, I'm taking two years off. Wow. I went, all right. I've been playing with one artist for eight years. Yeah. Now I'm going to play with all the other artists. And you did. Yeah, I did. I went out to LA and I built a discography that'll never be happen again because there's no more budgets. I mean, for the people who don't know my discography, it's stupid because it's like, it's okay. First of all, to be a drummer in a band is hard. To be a session drummer is hard. And very few drummers are accepted in both worlds. Uh-huh. Not only did I do it in both worlds, yeah. but I did it in Nashville, yeah. and I did it in L.A., and yeah. I did it in New York, and then I got the reputation, this guy can play anything. Yeah. But then, it's crazy. Oh, look, at, I didn't calculate. I just worked my ass off and was the right guy always for every situation. So, yeah. And people then, it's like as Don was said in my autobiography, Sex, Drums, Rock, and Roll, he goes, oh, man, I hire Kenny because he saves my session. He yeah. motivates the room. Yes. That's, being, that's being a team player, yeah. a, serving, a serving player. And so Don would call me up. Oh, we're doing Elton John. Oh, we're doing Bob Dylan. Oh, we're doing Iggy Pop. Oh, we're doing this guy, that guy. Oh, we're doing a TV show. Uh, we're doing The High Women. That's Johnny Cash, Willie Nelson, Chris yeah. Christopherson, yeah. Waylon Jennings. Then I played with Ray Charles. I played with... Oh, uh, then you're playing. Then I was with the Pumpkins. Then with yeah. Alice Cooper, yeah. Tony Iron from Sabbath, Lady then Gaga, pu- Bruno Mars. Yeah, Alana. I mean, it's I the, saw you with Jerry Lee Lewis a year and a half ago at Riot Fest. You're awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, that's great. That was a uh, that was cool. That was so fun, that was dude. A blast. That, the audience was so cool for him. Oh, they I know, him. and they were cool. I was with a bunch of like 16 year olds near the soundboard, and they were like. Uh, who are these guys? Who is that old guy up there? And I said, and I said, well, you better take note of today because yeah. when he's gone, you're going to say you saw him. <laughs> yeah, that guy, that guy invented rock and roll. Kenny, is- I tell you, man, we cannot thank you enough for joining our podcast, yeah. Beer and Music. Two things we love to talk about. And we have, uh, you know, for our fans out there listening, we have Ken Aronoff, who is not only a world-class drummer, uh, like you said, 60 to play the artist with 60 Grammy nominations, 300 million albums sold, work with tons of the best artists in the world. You're a best selling author with your sex, drums, and rock and roll. You've won awards. You're one of the 100 greatest drummers of Rolling Stone. You're number one studio drummer, number one pop drummer. You went to Indiana University. Yes, go Hoosiers. You're a professor. Uh, you have your own inspirational speaking company. So basically, you've done absolutely nothing in your life. So you should be ashamed of yourself. I know. My mom, well, you know what? Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to catch up during this COVID-19 thing. I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at the mirror and I'm going, come on, Kenny. You can, be so, you can become somebody. Right. There's still time. Yeah, there's time. There's still become some. Hey, they, the the Patriots. They need a quarterback. Tom Brady's leaving. Maybe I'll throw, maybe I'll throw football for the Patriots this year. Why I mean, not? 
Is there anyone what that do can you, do it? I think it's you. Yeah. <laughs> what are you You're, doing? What, what are you doing? doing during all this, all this coronavirus? What I'm doing is, uh, I, I believe in a foundation, both mentally, physically, emotionally, and spiritually. And uh, and I don't mean religious or anything, but just uh, meaning that you you have, you have to be strong and have a foundation, so that when adversity comes at you, you literally like uh, judo, you just redirect it and you yeah. stay uh, focused. So I eat real healthy. And I, uh, yeah. and I, and I work out every day. You're one and of the then, fittest, not only one of the coolest looking dudes all the time, but the, seriously, one of the <laughs> fittest looking, look at that. Look at that gun. That, that's a fit old man. Dude. That's a gun, man. Yeah. Uh, but um, yeah, every day I play the drums two to three hours, uh, do technique. And I run the that's, Joe Satriani show because that's yeah. the tour that I'll be doing next. Yeah. And um, at this point, that's what I'm doing. And I do have some sessions that my engineer was going to record me. This was something with me. So anyway, I have such people send me the files. I keep a distance from my engineer. He's in this room I'm in, and I stay in the other room. And um, I, I wrote a second book that I really need to go revisit. And uh, I have um, a lot of, I mean, my time is completely full. It's just, it's, it's, I'm as overwhelmed during this downtime with the amount of work I have to do wow. as I was when I'm uh, on tour and doing wow. sessions. Wow. I've got, yeah, I've got a lot of going and you know, there's a documentary that's they, they've been filming. Uh, uh, we filmed a week last year and a week this year. I have a speaking business where I have to constantly update yeah. and, and work on stuff. I did an interview yesterday for Forbes magazine. There's uh, just tons of shit a lot of stuff. flying. I mean, I literally have to, um, it looks like it says, uh, no, never mind. So anyway, so yeah, I, I'm busy. I'm busy. I'm well, busy. When, you, when you're one of the world's greatest drummers and, uh, and award winning and everything, you know, I'm playing you're, you're, when you're that much in demand, man, that's, uh, you know, you, I'm sorry, but you, you brought it on yourself, buddy. I hate to say it. You're gonna have to I know. That. You know what the thing is, the thing is, is that because I realized what my purpose in life was, see, when you realize what your purpose in life is, after I saw the Beatles on TV, when I was age 10, I went, I want to do that. And eventually, 50 years later, I'm playing on a CBS special called The Night That Changed America, honoring the Beatles for that Ed Sullivan show. Now I'm playing with Paul McCartney in Ringo Starr, the remaining Beatles oh, that, that, that influenced wow. me to ever become a drummer. That's and I amazing. told Ringo, I told Ringo, I played the Grammys the night before with him, but I never had a moment with him. When I was done playing that show, I, there was th 30 more minutes left. And I played with Ringo and Paul, <clears throat> but I walk out to the audience to find my wife. And there's uh, Tom Hanks, his wife, Ringo Starr, his wife. Then there's Paul McCartney's girlfriend, uh, George, uh, George Harrison's widow, Yoko Ono, Sean Lennon, Tom Cruise, Johnny Depp, and uh, Sean Penn. And I'm going by there. I'm like, holy wow. shit. And, 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 and Ringo's doing this. Bravo. Bravo, Mr. Aronoff. And I'm like, that was my moment. Now I've met him, but now I'm going to talk to him. So I, I'm kind of like trying to figure out what to say. And I just followed my heart. So I get down on one knee because everyone's looking at me and I'm, I'm in an arena. And before I could say anything, he goes, oh, that's okay. I'm already married, Kenny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, that's so, funny. That's funny. <laughs> but what I said to him was, and I thought it was going to be stupid, but he loved it. And his wife had tears in his eyes. He's not talking to me stupid. I went, everybody says this to you, but I said it. I said, you're the reason why I play drums. You're the reason why I play rock and roll. You and the Beatles set me on a course at age 10 that I've been on ever since. Right. It's he, really true. He probably took it to heart though, right? I mean, you he know. He did. His, his oh, wife, sure. very much so. There's, you know okay, there, there's me saying that to him and then there's yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, no, it's true. I think, I think what uh, uh, people, like he's a very authentic, he yeah. also realized he's his really purpose. Genuine. He's very honest. So yeah. when he, it was not just what I said, it was him feeling what I said. Right. And he realized he really means it. Yeah. And as I walked away, I realized in order to be great at what you do, you have to love it so much in order to, to, to work hard, to be self-disciplined and to persevere through all the shit. That's, and that ties into this whole COVID-19. If you love who you are and you enjoy your life and you right. have realized your purpose, Right. It will help you persevere through these obstacles because when I come in here every day or even when I work, work out, I'm loving the fact that I'm doing that. And so every day I've got love and joy in my heart yeah. because I'm doing. 
things I love. So let me ask you this question. Where do you, where did you get, first of all, your energy is infectious. I mean, this is the first time we've met. Uh, it's so funny. So when Kenny and I were texting each other, so we, we have a couple things in common. We have a very dear mutual friend, Maria, who, who helped uh, facilitate our introduction. We both spent time at Indiana University. You were a couple years before me. Um, and we sat next to each other at an Adrian Ballou concert at the Bluebird. Wow. Which, which was too funny. I remember that day. That's, and I was wow. chatting. That's when we both had more hair too, by the way. <laughs> but that was actually the same year that um, you played at the Audio Auditorium with Dan Ross. I think it was. Hey, yeah. was, it, was it the Bluebird or Time Out? No, it was Bluebird. It was oh, okay. the bird. Yeah, okay. it was definitely the bird. And I was sitting right next to you and I'm like, wow. and I was sitting there funny. I'm like, yeah, this is Kenny Arnoff. <laughs> and then we started chatting for a little bit. I'm like, I'm like, I'll remember him, but he'll never remember me. Uh, I was like, if I ever meet that guy again, I'm going to tell him. And sure enough, here God. we are. But um, yeah, but that was, uh, but it's great. But so where do you, where did you get this, uh, this energy, this infectious energy? Is it something that it's in your family? Was it that, uh, I mean, because your energy, first of all, you're, you are, you're the hardest hitting drummer of all time, but all your energy is just, uh, is infectious. Where do you, where did you get that? I mean, obviously you developed it over time, but was that something that, that, uh, you know, that came from something in particular or what? Well, I, I would have to say that, you know, in all fairness, there's a lot of genetics there. You know, um, I mean, I was born wired hot. Uh, I, uh, I've, uh, I mean, dude, I, I was a musician in high school, but I was a three letterman jock. Uh, by the time I was a sophomore in high school, I was on three varsity sports with my twin brother. I mean, I had abundance of energy. I'd go from school to, you know, three hours of a varsity sport home to do homework and then at, at, after homework I'd, be, I'd rehearse in our barn with a rock band wow. and it was endless energy wow. and I've, I've always had it um uh so i'm i'm very yeah. fortunate in that so i, I get i i can thank my mom has that kind of energy she's 94 uh not moving quite as fast as me right now but yeah. but uh yeah so th there's that but then i uh but but because i i love the feeling that I get yeah. for being this way, you yeah. know, I just try to stay as healthy and uh, do everything I can to sustain that great feeling. Oh man, that's great. Well, you know what? Um, we, uh, we'd be remiss in saying that, you know, as part of this beer and music podcast, we have uh, our local, these oh, yeah. local breweries sponsor. So this podcast is sponsored, which is great for Kenny and I and John, of course. Yeah. So this is sponsored by the Bloomington um, Brewing Company in Bloomington, Indiana. And they sent us these great, beers uh to, to sample and uh i got he sent us man uh i got a 10 speed mosaic wheat a vinyl slap oatmeal stout kirkwood oh. male ruby blue amber and a back country accessory. which one did you, did, yes. did you get this i got the mask too yeah uh he also sent me a an F well yeah they sent me some drum keys oh, oh what nice. yeah drum keys that's right. I'm cracking open the uh, backcountry session IPA. Yeah. What do you got? I can't. But I still got to play the drums. So you All drink right. for me. Is it good? Oh, that's good. It is. Of good. course. Did you get that collection too? He's got all these different. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Sure did. Delicious. Oh yeah. Oh, that was good. good. So uh, Jeff Meese is the guy, and and I, Kenny, I think you met Jeff because yeah. He, uh, yeah. yeah. So he was saying that this backcountry. Uh, session IPA is they've collaborated. Uh, we'll appreciate this with the Indiana Forest Alliance, where they work to uh, lobby the state government for the protection of the Indiana State Forest. So, oh, that's um, true. Yeah. So this beer won a silver medal the last two years at the Indiana State Fair, and uh, apparently this was brewed ten days ago. So you know what? Uh, I'm gonna call Jeff up. I think I think it's time they have the Kenny Aronoff uh, beer. Yeah. Actually, all right. You that, Listen, man. you guys. So so glad we got to do this. Oh, and uh, yeah, thanks man. for having me on. And they can contact you at your website, www.kennyaronoff.com. You, of course, can get your fantastic book, Sex, Drums, and Rock and Roll on Amazon. Yeah. And yeah. social media, follow you on Instagram at Kenny Aronoff, at LinkedIn, Kenny Aronoff, Facebook, Kenny Aronoff, your Twitter, Aronoff Official, and your website, I just said, www.kennyaronoff.com. Are you ready? We are ready. We are ready. All right, it's day two, Los Angeles, lockdown, self-quarantine. I'm doing interviews today, but this is how we do it. Say hi. Hey, man. Business as always, but we can't do interviews in person. This That's is right. Safe 
We're doing safe distancing here. You guys, keep your distance. Isolate. We'll get through this. You too, Follow man. me. I'll show you how. Love it. Cheers, brother. <laughs> It's all about the beer to us, um, not a fancy marketing scheme or anything like that. It's, it's all about the beer, and it, that's what's great about it is the beer is fantastic. I remember I tried the Ruby Bloom Amber, and it was really my first introduction into craft beer. I found that love and passion burning inside of me as I came into the Bloomington Brewing Company. And I loved it, and I said, this is what I want to be a part of. It's been only in the you know southern Indiana region for a very long time now. The Bloomington Brewing Company was the first southern Indiana brew pub, I guess you could say. We kind of embody the spirit of the, the college town and uh, southern Indiana. What sets us apart is probably our focus and dedication to really good quality beer. You think about the bigger breweries, they're all about the science of it. We're a little more on the creative end. It's a good combination of art and science. Craft beer is really a, it's a communal thing. It's uh, just one kind of big family, and I love being a part of that. We're so excited to have you on our show or, uh, with our, our, our podcast, Music and a Brew. We're chatting with Mr. Jeff Meese, who is the proprietor, owner, brewmaster of Bloomington Brewing Company. And by the way, thank you so much for sending, we just had an amazing podcast with Ken Aronoff, world-class drummer, author, and just one of the greatest guys, inspirational speaker, I, I got it, my dad. And you shipped up the shipped us these fantastic beers, which we've been drinking. And and uh, Kenny uh, was just ecstatic to have it, as were John and I from the uh, we're with the Simple Radicals band. Thank you for doing that. How do you tell us about? Uh, let, let's talk about Kenny for a second. Tell us about because uh, you're a Bloomington guy, and you and I have something in common. You, we both went to IU. You stayed. I left. Good for right. you. You're, I'm so happy for you. Um, and Kenny obviously was down there for many years playing with Mellencamp and went to school down there. He was a professor down there. Tell me about your, or tell us about your relationship with Kenny. I'm assuming he's probably, has been at your brewery uh, and your restaurant. We started a restaurant in 89 and right. then I worked on changing the law in Indiana to allow brew pups to exist in 93. We added a brewery to it, the Bloomington Brewing Company, first one in Southern Indiana in 94. And I remember Kenny used to come in and be like, oh, that's Kenny Aronoff, you know. This was in Bobby Knight days. And yeah. John John Mellencamp, I I never met him in the restaurant, but we were we became in about 94, there was a Bloomington's, you know, progressive college town. And we were one of the first cities to have to go smoke free, and John, of course, is a big uh, big smoker, uh, sex smoker. So he would always like he didn't come in, you know. Right. Uh, Mellicamp says it's a small town, and he wrote that about Bloomington. That, that's right. And uh, and you're right. I he, think that was about Seymour. Maybe it was about Seymour, right? <laughs> okay. Right. No one talks about Seymour, Indiana. I know Seymour, <laughs> you know Seymour, but not many people know Seymour, Indiana. But you know, it's such a small town, and you've been down there since I think you said since 1980, right? So. You know everyone, and everyone's everyone, and everyone's everyone, everyone. What is so unique and special about uh, Bloomington Brewery uh, Company beer that you really uh, espouse and promote? Well, uh, you know, the liquid is great. And I, we've just always tried to keep the liquid great and have a lot of integrity in the little things that we do. You know, we, we pay we pay a little bit more for grain. We don't buy the cheapest grain we can buy. We don't buy the cheapest hops we can buy. We filter all our water. We just got a lot of things that we do that are about making the product good. And that doesn't necessarily, marketing sells stuff fast, you know, but quality sells stuff for a long time over time. And, you know, I'm kind of, I admire these European breweries and distilleries and wineries that, you know, in Europe, you know, some of you've seen them, some of these, uh, you know, Franz O'Connor, or some of these ones run by monks. They're hundreds of years old. It's right. taken them hundreds of years to become 
you know what they are and i'm kind of okay with that if i could if we could get this set up and build enough integrity and passion and belief in what we do then it can carry on and be benefiting right people along the way so i want people at my bar you know you come to bloomington sit down hey what's local drink this stuff like that's what speaks to me